Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Could I just say, um, it, it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful crowd we have here this morning. We're just waiting for our final panelists. So if you could bear with us for one or two more moments, and then we'll commence proceedings. OK, thank you. OK, uh, we're going to proceed because I know there's so many events happening today that uh, it's important we, we stick to time as best we can. Uh, firstly, my name is Fergal Mighton. I'm the Irish ambassador to the UN. Uh, I keep on saying I'm the new Irish ambassador, but I've been here since August. And in UN terms, you can't say you're new after a few months. Uh, but it is great to be here. It's great to have the, the, the dynamism and energy of CSW Week. I think it's something you've all missed. Uh, we were here last, week, last year in person, but it wasn't quite the same. So I think there's a sense that we're back to full normality here in terms of events, meetings, and energy. Um, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all here to this event, which is organized by Ireland and the Irish Consortium. I won't get the name right. The Irish Consortium on Gender-Based Violence. Uh, it's a really, really important topic, uh, the impact of technology and gender-based violence. We all know about the, the benefits of technology, and I've just come back from uh, the UN conference on least developed countries in Doha, where we were discussing the, the benefits of technology in terms of development. But we all know that technology has a very, very dark side, or certainly has been used to very, very uh, dark uh, effect. And I suppose that's what we want to explore here today, and we have a very, st very strong panel. And, and so with that, I'm gonna hand over to Ireland's Minister for Children, Equality, Disability, Integration, and Youth, Roderick O'Gorman. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Virgo. Uh, honourable Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, it's an honour to welcome you all to our side event here today. Gender-based violence and technology, risks, opportunities, and challenges. And Ireland is absolutely t delighted to be co-hosting this event today with the Irish Consortium on Gender-Based Violence. Um, the Secretary General, in his report on this year's priority theme, analyzes how technologies in the digital age can be harnessed so that women and girls can enjoy equal opportunities and rights and that they have the skills to participate in innovative processes and shape the values and principles that should underpin the safe and equitable use of digital technologies. Um, the use of ICT and other digital tools is, is a really great enabler. However, as the Secretary General also observed, technology can also facilitate gender-based violence. And online and technology-facilitated gender-based violence does not exist on its own. It has to be understood as part of a wider continuum. And these acts are pursued with the objective of controlling, harming, silencing, or discre discrediting a woman or a group of women. Uh, women in the public eye and women who experience multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination are targeted to an even greater extent than men. And this morning's discussion represents an opportunity to delve deeper, uh, to look at both the risks and opportunities of, technolo of technology regarding gender-based violence in the development and humanitarian settings, and to take an intersectional lens to better understand how women and girls in all of their diversity are impacted by this issue. And I really encourage everybody to consider this event as a space for dialogue, for the exchange of ideas, and for some active engagement as well. So on the topic today, you're going to hear contributions from a distinguished international group. We have Her Excellency Sarah Schlitz, the Secretary of State for Gender Equality, Equal Opportunity, and Diversity from Belgium. We have the uh, Honourable Nima Lungangira, uh, the Member of Parliament of Tanzania. We have Dr Je Jennifer Okeke, the Vice Chair of the National Women's Council of Ireland. Uh, we hope also to be joined by uh, Rebecca Kila, Gender-Based Violence Coordinator with the Rainbow Initiative, Sarah Leone, uh, Ifra Ahmed, founder of the Ifra Foundation, and uh, Nish Lamakarki, the Women's Rights Specialist with ActionAid Nepal. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to hand you over now to our moderator uh, for, to, uh, for today's session, Jennifer, Jennifer McCarthy Flynn, coordinator of the Irish Consortium on Gender-Based Violence. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Minister, and also thank you very much to Ambassador Myson for wel welcoming us here today. Uh, it's wonderful to be here at the 67th session of the Commission on the Status of Women. Um, I'm sure some of you here in the room were here for this, the session just prior to ours around the situation of women and girls in Afghanistan who are experiencing some of the most egregious experiences of violence, harassment and abuse, but are also using technology to raise their voices and to have their truth heard and seen across the world. So our session on technology facilitated gender-based violence, I think, is particularly resonant uh, in terms of what the opportunities can be. But of course, um, uh, what we're also here to talk about today is also the risks. Um, my name is Jennifer McCarthy Flynn, as the Minister said, and I'm the coordinator of the Irish Consortium on Gender-Based Violence. Our running order this morning will be, uh, I will be speaking for a short time, uh, highlighting some of the findings of our very new uh, research brief on this issue, gender-based violence and technology risks, opportunities and challenges. Um, you'll hear contributions from two of our members and local partners, as the Minister said, ActionAid and ActionAid Nepal and the IFRA Foundation based in Somalia. And then we'll hear from our eminent panel of speakers where I hope I can facilitate what I'm sure will be a lively discussion about both the risks, the challenges, but also some of the opportunities that technology is bringing to actually tackle gender-based violence. For those of you who aren't familiar with the consortium, we were established in 2005 in response to ongoing and systematic sexual violence against women and girls in the Darfur region of South Sudan during those conflicts. The consortium has a very unique membership. It's 12 Irish-based international humanitarian development and aid agencies, and we are very welcome that the Irish Defence Forces and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Irish Aid are part of our consortium. Uh, our members work in some of the most um, conflict, uh, resource-constrained, fragile, humanitarian, conflict and post-conflict countries in the world. But inside those contexts, the consortium's core belief is that we can have a world without fear of violence against women and girls. And we can have a world where women and girls can reach their full potential in societies that can respect theirs and all people's rights and dignities. But we also know that we cannot achieve shared goals of gender equality, sustainable peace and development without addressing gender-based violence. Um, I'm going to start first with giving a short overview. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just seeing that I'm so pleased our colleague from Sierra Leone has been able to join us. I'm just going to give her a moment to, to come up and join us here on the platform. That's excellent. I'm so, so pleased that she's been able to join us. Um, so as well, as well as this panel event today, we have also, the consortium has also produced a short uh, that we hope impactful research and policy paper uh, on this issue of technology-based, gender-based violence. Um, it's available on our website. It combines a review of available data, of which unfortunately there is little at a global level, although some regions, including Europe, have produced more. Um, one of our asks would be that we need funding to examine this, this subject and this issue and the challenges of this issue in low-income countries, in humanitarian settings. Um, we're going to look at some of the policy and legislation innovations which can point the way to some of the ways in which we need to respond to this issue uh, globally. And it also combines case studies from um, consortium members and their partners, including Irish Aid and the uh, Interparliamentary Union, Interna uh, Plan International Ireland, ActionAid Ireland and ActionAid Nepal, the IFRA Foundation and Concern Worldwide with Concern Lebanon. And um, we'd like to thank... Brianna Gizori, Gidorzi, Sarah Dickens, Anya Hanrahan for their, for their work, and also to our colleagues in the UNFPA who are launching a substantial guide later on uh, during uh, CSW 67 and who gave us much of, uh, expertise and, and their time. I'm sure for many people in the room here today, I don't need to tell you the horrifying statistics around gender-based violence, but just some of, the, some of the overarching ones that are the context for this work today. One in three women globally will have an experience of physical, sexual, or domestic violence or abuse in her lifetime. With one in every three people now globally requiring humanitarian assistance, more than 70% of women and girls in those contexts will experience gender-based violence. So the stresses, the pressures, the vulnerabilities that are exposed in those contexts increases the risks to women and girls of gender-based violence. However, funding to tackle these issues amounts to less than 0.12% of all funding to humanitarian action, which represents only a third of the funding that is requested. If we are going to make substantial impact on tackling gender-based violence, donors, member states, uh, and the UN need to increase substantially the funding and the resources that are available. 
We know that in all contexts, sexual and other forms of gender-based violence, including the threat of violence, is used as a tool to prevent women and girls from stepping outside prescribed roles, and it is used to punish them when they do. We know that technology has played a particularly aggressive part in creating this hostile and abusive environment. Technology permeates our world, and the Sustainable Development Goals have rightly set a target of increasing access to the internet as an important step in addressing gender inequality. 83% of women have mobile phones, and 58% have access to the internet, and we expect that will only increase over time, of course. And this increasing access to technology, to online form, to, digital, to, di to a digital life, essentially, um, means that the risks are also increasing. Technology-facilitated gender-based violence should not be seen as different or separate to other forms. There are some unique factors at play, but the root cause is the same as other forms of gender-based violence, persistent, pervasive gender inequality. In 2021, one of the most comprehensive global studies to date on this form of violence from the Economist Intelligence Unit from 51 countries around the world highlighted that 38% of women surveyed had experienced personally experienced online gender-based violence, and 85% of women had witnessed hostility, abuse, harassment, violence directed against another woman through technology or in online forums. However, there is a massive gap in our understanding of the experiences of women without full access or frequent access to the internet and online spaces, predominantly women living in low-income countries. And there is confusion around terminology and therefore about how we can tackle it, confusion in legislation, confusion in criminal justice systems. There needs to be real harmonization of terminology as well as a very substantial increase in research, particularly in low-income and conflict-affected countries. Um, our colleagues, Nisa Lamakarki from ActionAid in Nepal, um, has a very illuminating case study that I'm going to share with you now. She wasn't able to join us here today, unfortunately, but she's recorded a contribution for us about how the, the issue is emerging in the context of, of ActionAid's work in Nepal and how they've responded. And it illuminates, I think, many of the issues that we are facing uh, with technology-based, gender-based violence. I'm Nisa Karki from ActionAid Nepal. Women and girls are the center of our program, and as a part of our work, we have a project funded by Iris Aid, where women and girls are the target populations where safety, security, and economic empowerment is the priority. So during the COVID-19 lockdowns in Nepal, the uses of phone among women and girls increase, and that increase online violence as well. So to understand and identify the online violence, harassment, and abuse via internet and social media, we conducted a short survey. Uh, in that survey, 128 women and girls participated from dif 13 different districts of Nepal. So as a result of a survey revealed that 34.5 portions of women and girls had experienced online violence during the lockdown period. And it also revealed that um, the majority of violence had been perpetrated by the stranger. So in response to the survey result, Action 8 uh, decided to act on it, where Action Aid, in collaboration and coordination with the authorities and women's group, uh, conducted various awareness raising uh, programs, uh, where we not only raise awareness on the gender based violence, especially uh, technology facilitated, but also empower young women and girls uh, to know what to do if they experience such online violences. So, for example, in Chitwan district, one of our uh, implementing partners, uh, together with the representatives of local police, conducted awareness sessions uh, at two schools, uh, at two schools, where the program basically focused on the pros and cons of the social media platforms, as well as we also discuss on the safe ways of using them, reporting options, security settings, and also shared uh, free hotline numbers. So our partner also works closely with the survivors and the police where the cases were registered. Similarly, in Mokwanpur district, the young girls and women who attended our organizations, uh, which was hosted in collaboration with the police and our Mokwanpur women's group, one of our implementing partners, shared that they had never previously discussed online violence, and yet almost all were users of social media, particularly Facebook and TikTok. 
So through this initiation, Action in Nepal, in collaboration with the women's group, has reached over 250 women, adolescents, girls, and boys to prevent and respond to forms of technology-facilitated gender-based violence. Uh, uh, there is a cyber bureau of Nepal police at the national level, but at the local level, Action in Nepal is working and encouraging local police to address and focus on these online violences. Action in Nepal is continuously coordinating and working closely with the local police uh, to raise awareness on online violence, as well as we also found that we, they have a very strong commitment to working on this going forward. I think one of the things about the Action Aid Nepal contribution and our, and our colleague Nisa is how it really highlights that just like other forms of gender-based violence, it is very much targeted at women and girls, but that there's a very, although the prevalence is high, there, there is still a very low level of recognition of the issue, both by the women and girls themselves being able to name that that is what is happening to them, which is a kind of a common factor, as those of you who work in the field will know, but also a recognition that it is a form of violence and it is a form of abuse, and that criminal although they're open to discussions and to having it being raised, there's a very low level of awareness still within criminal justice and even within legislative context of the nature of technology-based, uh, gender technology-facilitated gender-based violence. Um, and that this high prevalence is really only beginning to emerge clearly within humanitarian contexts. Although, as I said, it shares the same origins, it is just another form of gender-based violence, there are unique characteristics to technology facilitated gender-based violence that we do need to be aware of. One of the most pernicious issues about it is that it can occur across multiple legal and regulatory jurisdictions, which makes it very hard to tackle and very hard to challenge. The perpetrator can be in one country, one region, one continent. The victim can be in another. The platform that's being used can be in another or can be distributed across several countries or several regions. This, as you can imagine, makes the whole situation extremely complex and extremely difficult to raise challenges and to hold perpetrators to account. The abuse and the violence can be perpetrated anonymously and at a distance. Um, it permeates spaces where sometimes survivors have been able to feel safe before, the home, their own bedrooms, their own communities, because it comes into their lives in ways that other forms have been able to be held out through safeguarding, uh, safeguarding practices uh, and protocols. And some forms, particularly image-based abuse, can be permanently available. I mean, there are just horrific stories of images, videos. Now we also have the phenomenon of AI-generated deep fake image-based abuse, which is circulating globally and may continue to exist, possibly even permanently in digital spaces, which is a fairly for horrific uh, thought to, to consider, really, for a young woman to be, to be facing the prospect of. Uh, as the minister raised, it's very important to take an intersectional approach to this issue. Young women women of colour, black women, disabled women and members of the LGBTQI community are being particularly targeted, often in very concerted and organised ways. Um, an important survey that was done by Plan International highlights this, particularly the targeting of young, of young girls. Women who are active, and I'm sure some of them who are here with us today will be able to share their direct experiences of this, women who are active in public life as politicians, activists and, women, and human rights defenders are explicit targets of technology facilitated gender-based gender violence and abuse, including highly organised campaigns. This poses a significant threat to the limited gains made by women and girls in political and public life and leadership over recent decades. And it is undermining an inclusive and diverse democracy at a community, national and global level. The consequences are just as severe as other forms of gender-based violence, both in terms of the harms, misogynistic, sexist, degrading, sexist portrayals of women online and the behaviours, technology being used to bully, to stalk, to harass, to intimidate. Um, and exactly the same sorts of impacts as we see of, of other types of gender-based violence. And the reporting situation is just as terrible as, as, as UN Women has, has documented elsewhere. 
um, UN Women has said that less than 40% of women will report any form, will seek any for help for any form of violence. And reporting to private technology companies can often be extremely ineffective. That study from the, Enco the Economist Intelligence Unit says that only 25% of women have even tried to report the violence they experienced online, and even fewer than that, 14%, reported it to an, to an offline agency. There is a recognition that technology facilitated gender-based violence is an issue, is a problem, and must be, must be tackled. Just some of the public recognition of that, I'm just only going to name some of those. Um, in 2022, the African Commission passed a resolution on the protection of women against digital violence in Africa. The UN Generation Equality Forum has an actual action calling for the elimination of online and technology facilitated violence. And the Global Partnership for Action on Gender-Based Online Harassment and Abuse established to bring together governments, international organizations, civil society, and the private sector was launched in 2021 as a way to prioritize and tackle this issue. A very innovative development, which we would certainly recommend for consideration by other member states, is Australia's eSafety Commissioner, who has legal powers to help people get harmful content removed from online immediately and works with online platforms fining, sanctioning, or are taking legal action against them if they don't respond. And that's a fairly recent development, uh, 2020, I believe. Overall, I think the, the kinds of actions that we're, look, we're looking for and that are required um, are clear. Civil and criminal laws need to become specific to these types of harms and must have a particular focus on women in public roles. International agreements to fight that multi-jurisdictional element and activities and harms need to be developed immediately and urgently. And statutory agencies that either exist must have their powers amended or must be established and be given the authority and the resources to both to have regulatory powers over private technology companies to proactively develop safeguarding processes and immediately remove harmful content. And technology providers must increase their accountability to women and girls. They must have and enforce strict codes of conduct for users on their platforms, and they must begin to use as a, a, a priori planning of safety by design principles to prevent technology facilitated abuses before they can even begin to emerge. And responding to these risks will allow us to focus on the opportunities. I'm gonna give the last word to Ifra Ahmed, the um, stalwart gender-based violence campaigner seeking to end FGMC in Somalia about what those opportunities could be if we can mitigate, end or prevent some of, some of the risks and the abuses. And the IFRA Foundation is using technology in a very innovative way to tackle the very specific form of gender-based violence of FGM. And I'll allow it for the last word to see what could be possible if we can mitigate the risks. Hi, my name is Ifra Ahmed. I'm founder of Ifra Foundation. Ifra Foundation's main objective is zero tolerance on FGM. Recent assessment in Somalia still shows FGM is 98%. United Nations resolution in 2030 is to end the FGM. As you know, in Somalia, we are very far from that 10 years, I think it's eight years to end the FGM now in Somalia. Ifra Foundation come with new approach on ending FGM, which is Dear Daughter. Dear Daughter, it has a three pillars. Um, media awareness, community empowerment, and advocacy. Where everyone can go to Dear Daughter website and make a play. People who have empowered by the campaign, they go online or they do a video to make the pledge to say no to FGM or I'm not going to cut my daughter or future daughter. The rule of the technology uh, UNFPA and IFRA Foundation, they created on the website, the daughter website, where people can go and make a pledge on, uh, online and also uh, videos. It also goes on Somali and English. Uh, we also have a, a radio contribution where we distribute uh, community on over 300 uh, radios. We all know that uh, Somalia, 85% people listen to radios. We know how important it is and the message it passes on um, to the community. Um, the reason we distribute the radio is that during the 16-day activism, during International Women's Day, during 6th of February, there is a lot of activity happening around, around the world and Somalia. So there is a religious leaders debate, there is a media debate, there is activists speaking on the radios. 
um, so those people who are in the IDB centers, they at least have an opportunity to listen to the radio and hear the issue of FGM and also how um, people like IFRA Foundation are fighting on the zero tolerance on FGM. In Somalia, as I said before, 75% uh, are young people. Everyone have a smartphone. So uh, a part of the Dear Daughter website, we use social media like um, Facebook, uh, Twitter space, and Instagram, and Snapchat. And also sometimes we invite the um, people like, you know, who has a high number of TikTok, because we know that uh, TikTok plays a big role for the society, especially young people. So those are the, um, the other technology we use on, on our message passing. Um, as, as we use all those uh, networks, we see now the pledging, how it, it reached to uh, 60,000 pledges on our website. And that we just raise awareness and we tell people, we talk to the community. And also the Dear Daughter website, last year, it came global third place for the website, um, Global Website Award, which we're really happy about it because that shows how our campaign awareness on FGM in technology have supported. Because if people haven't seen it, that the Dear Daughter campaign on the globally, uh, we wouldn't be reaching on the third place. Uh, we wanted to be on the first place, but it didn't happen. So that shows how technology have actually have helped us to uh, reach on the number of people to pledge. We want really to reach uh, about uh, 100,000 pledges so that um, we can go to the Somali government, whether it's a, a parliament speaker or the prime minister or the president of Somalia, because. 98% of the FGM is practiced in Somalia, and there is the issues there. And also, we know that um, our awareness, radios and TV and websites has brought it uh, last 12 months in last year. There was zero death on FGM. That proves that how we came a long way on reaching that, on zero tolerance on that. Because there was a high profile cases in Kismayo during Christmas last year, and there was a, over 20 young girls has been cut. Eight of them have been bleeding, but the family members, they have brought it to those young girls to hospital. So when I approached to the, I went to the village and I spoke to the families, I asked them, how do they know that? Because we all know that the IDB comes, there was an issue where young girls are cut and bleed to death. But when we spoke to them, they said because they hear on the radio a story of young girls who have died on FGM, and that is what brought them to bring hospital. And that's how the technology is supporting us to basically uh, ending or even be able to know uh, FGM. just ending there just on a slightly more hopeful note about what some of the opportunities are as well we'd really like our our, our paper is available at www.gbv.ie and we'd really like to encourage you all to just to, ha to have a look at it because it does outline some of the really innovative technological opportunities that are available as well as well as highlighting the risks and there are some legislative innovations some technological innovations and some practice innovations there that I think could be very helpful for member states or NGOs who are beginning to try and come into this work and to, to, in, to integrate addressing technology facilitated GBV into their work as well. Um, and so thank you very much to ActionAid Nepal and ActionAid Ireland and to the IFRA Foundation for providing us with those contributions today. And we're just extremely sorry that they weren't able to join us today uh, here at, at the UN uh, in New York. Um, so we're going to move over to the second part of, of the session, which is more of a panel with some, some input from our, our very eminent panel speakers here. And then hopefully we will still have time for a discussion. So I'm going to hand back to, to Minister Roderick O'Gorman and ask him if he can kick us off with, with what he'd like to share with us about what Ireland is doing um, at a national domestic level um, on the, in the area of te technology facilitated gender-based violence. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, Jennifer, and, and thanks to all the, the, the contributors in, in, in the previous uh, section. So achieving uh, gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls is a key priority uh, for Ireland's foreign policy. 
and ending gender-based violence is an overarching objective, and it's central to achieving equality and uh, sustainable peace, as well as to the basic fulfillment of women and girls' human rights. Uh, digital technologies have the potential to either mitigate or to widen inequalities. Uh, and I'd like to give an example of each uh, and how we have responded as a government. Technology obviously brings a, a wide variety of benefits to the lives of women and girls globally, learning, connecting, and participating in economic, social, and political life. And technology has long played a role in gender-based violence prevention and response initiatives, including help hotlines, information management systems, and access to help-seeking materials. And digital technology has enabled us to provide a coordinated, integrated national helpline service covering different aspects of support for victims of violence against women. Making information for victims available on one central website, which includes details of all helplines that are available, allows victims to choose and call the one that best meets his or her, her particular situation. Its elements are the Crime Victims Helpline, which can inform and direct the female victims of domestic or sexual violence to the most appropriate services, and two 24-hour helplines for domestic abuse and sexual violence, respectively. The importance of access to technology to victims of GBV and those who support them was underlined by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as were the in inequities perpetuated by the div digital divide that we all know does exist. Technology also pre prevent presents risks including the risk of technology facilitated gender-based violence. Um, and as well as other forms of gender-based violence, it is rooted in gender inequality. And such violence presents unique and challenging characteristics for policymakers. Jennifer outlined a few earlier on. It can, it can occur across multiple jurisdictions. It can be per perpetrated anonymously from a distance. It can invade spaces where survivors formerly felt safe. And image abuse can exist permanently in a digital space. And addressing image-based abuse and harmful online content is an area where Ireland has recently strengthened our legislative response. The Harassment, Harmful Communications and Related Offences Act has been in force since 2021. It created new offences around the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. And the Act not only criminalises the sharing of intimate images of a person without their consent, but it also criminalises the threat to do this, uh, as well as the sharing of those images known as deep fakes. So this legislation has been up and running now for just under two years, and already there have been some successful uh, prosecutions taken out underneath it. Um, in December of 2022, the um, Online Safety and Me Media Regulation Act of 2022 was signed into law by the, uh, by the Irish government, and it provides for the establishment of an online safety commissioner, and again, quite similar to the model from Australia that, that Jennifer spoke about earlier on. So this online safety commissioner will oversee the regulatory framework for online safety, including devising binding online safety codes that will set out designated online services, including certain social media services, certain social media platforms, how they are expected to deal with defined categories of harmful content on their platforms. And it is intended that this will have the effect of tackling the availability on designated uh, online platforms of intimate if images which have been shared without consent and of threatening or grossly offensive communications about or to another person. And these two uh, legislative responses, they're part of a broader set of measures that are set out across the Government of Ireland's Zero Tolerance Strategy, the third national strategy on domestic, sexual and gender-based violence. And this strategy encapsulates all the actions the Irish Government are taking, including those in the uh, technolo technology, technology and online space, but also the creation of a new national agency specifically dedicated to tackling domestic, sexual and gender-based violence and working and bringing in paid leave for victims of domestic violence. So I hope that gives you a, 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 a rough outline of some of the actions that have been undertaken by the Irish government in terms of tackling um, uh, technology facilitated <coughs> domestic, sexual and gender-based violence. Thanks, Jennifer.
Thank you very much, Minister Gorman. I mean, I think it's obviously there's some really excellent um, developments that you've outlined there. But I suppose one of the things that I am still left with, and I'm sure all of us are struck by, is how recent some of them are. Still pointing, I think, to um, you know national governments still at very early stages of being of developing their responses and being able to come to grips with, with technology facilitated gender-based violence. And um, though obviously some very interesting legislative and also regulatory um, pieces there that you that you've raised for us. Uh, I'd like now to turn to Dr. Jennifer Okoki to ask her to speak for us, uh, speak with us. Uh, Dr. Okoki is the Vice Chairperson of the National Women's Council in Ireland. Uh, she's also the Anti-Trafficking Coordinator of the Immigrant Council of Ireland, a community activist and a chairperson of a migrant rights organisation in Ireland. Dr. Okoki is also a board member of the European Network of Migrant Women and has extensive knowledge and expertise on, on a wide range of issues of gender-based violence, but with a special focus on anti-trafficking, human rights and migration rights for refugee and asylum seekers. Um, Jennifer was recently awarded her PhD in this area of anti-trafficking. So I'd like to hand over to Dr. Okoki now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I hope you can hear me very well. Um, I'm really glad to be part of this year's discussion and also to represent the National Women's Council here today as their vice chair. Um, the National Women's Council of Ireland um, mission is to lead and be a catalyst in the achievement of equality for women. We are the national representative um, organization for women and women's group in Ireland. A non-governmental, not-for-profit organization, the National Women's Council was founded in 1973. We seek to achieve women's equal, um, equality for women. We represent and take mandate from over 190 group uh, members of uh, member groups from across diverse backgrounds, sectors, and geographical locations within Ireland. The National Women's Council of Ireland works strategically as the national representative organization for women in Ireland by adding value to our members' work and progressing key equality and human rights issues for women across different areas, including climate action, leadership, women's health, economy equality, ensuring care work is valued, as well as gender-based violence and exploitation. The National Women's Council of Ireland chairs and conveys the National Observatory on Violence Against Women in Ireland, which was established in 2002. The observatory is an independent network of 22 grassroots national organizations that, came together, that comes together regularly to monitor progress on domestic, sexual, and gender-based violence in Ireland. This network provides an important space for organizations to work towards improving policies and service provision to prevent and support women victims, victim survivors of male violence. The National Observatory is comprised of a wide range of voices, including the voices of my, minority and marginalized women, including women in prostitution, migrant women, Roman traveler women, disabled women, rural women, and trans women. It strives to make visible the phenomenon of domestic, sexual, and gender-based violence that monitors government's commitments, both at national and international level. The observatory is also linked with the European um, Women's Lobby. As the National Women's Council celebrates its 50 years of ex existence and working for women's equality, we also reflect on the work we've been involved in over the years, more recently the work um, on the intercession of technology and gender-based violence. Women in public sphere are often subjected to unrelenting online abuse, not just to silence them, but also to prevent their participation in politics and public life. This is especially true for women from minority and marginalized backgrounds, who in addition to being subjected to sexist and misogynist abuse online, also have to deal with racism and homophobic abuses. In addressing this challenge of online abuses faced by women in politics, the National Women's Council in 2022 developed a toolkit on social media policies for political parties. This toolkit focused on violence and harassment as the cost of being a woman in politics, particularly for minority women as, as well as the emotional and professional sec, um, consequences for survivors. Furthermore, the toolkit highlights how technology facilitated abuses impact the functioning of democratic governance through the lack of female representation in decision-making roles and increased barriers for women's 
equality in politics. The National Women Council ensured that the toolkit provided all political party organizations in Ireland with a strategy for progressing a kinder, more civil, respectful, and gender-sensitive approach to politics, both online and, off and offline. Exploring the harms of gender stereotype, especially amongst young women, um, young women on social media and porn sites. The National Women Council noted that the discourse on social media platforms such as the Andrew Tate, which is rooted in mis misogyny, a deep sense and strongly held belief of male entitlement over women are rapidly increasing their influence on young boys. Such discourse Such discourses normalizes rape, violence towards women, and this has caused concern among various stakeholders, including politicians and teachers. For example, the Minister for Justice, Simon Harris, expressed concern about it and the type of content that is put online. He went on to highlight that the state must step up with better age-appropriate information on sex education, gendered violence that disproportionately affects women and girls, Porn sites such as the only farm, which is the fastest growing porn provider in the world with its bulk of sexually explicit content, created primarily by young women for the consumption of male fans, continue to influence young people's perception of gender and sexuality. The findings of a recent research carried out by Women's Aid, an organization that supports women um, who have experienced gender-based violence indicate that the vast majority, almost 81% of the 18 to 22-year-olds believe that pornography is increasingly, is increasing young men's interest in rough and violent sex. Therefore, we do recognize that at the heart of gender-based violence prevention are social norm changes. And online and social, um, social media spaces must be made to create opportunities for women and girls to challenge these harmful norms, including sexism, <coughs> homophobia, and racism. More importantly, they must be made available for, to allow women and girls to tell their truths. The devastating impact of COVID-19 pandemics accelerated the shifting of criminal acti activities into digital spaces. Traffickers use technology and internet for every um, phase of, crime, uh, of crime of trafficking in human beings, including advertisement, recruitment, transportation, and the payment for victims, especially women and children, in the sex trade. Exploitative sexual services via advertised on social media platform, escorts, and dating websites. This has worsened the this has worsened with the war in Ukraine, with over 85% 80, of those fleeing, fleeing um, war being identified as women and children. In Ireland, for example, as soon as Russia attacked Ukraine, civil society organizations, some of whom are members of the National Women Council, led by the Immigrant Council of Ireland, quickly organized themselves, not just to respond to the inflow of, fleeing, um, of those fleeing the war, but um, also with an, with an understanding that the risk of trafficking and exploitation is very high. The reality is that we did not have to wait for very long. The biggest Irish um, escort sites, Escort Island, noted a 250% increase in search on their website for Ukrainian porn and escorts. The same site also offered men the opportunity to ex experience the war-inspired fantasies with Ukrainian women. However, the use of technology in committing these crimes creates significant challenges for law enforcement officials, and we must recognize that. As criminals can operate remotely and, and reach out to more potential victims, as is the case in Ireland, where, for example, Escort Island is able to operate from outside of the Republic, but have also you know, from outside of the Republic. However, we've also seen fearless women like Mia Dorin, a survivor turned author and activist, start petition calling on the government to block such sites from being operational.
We recognize the negative impacts that such sites have, but we also recognize that technology can be harnessed for good to create positive social changes. In response to the growing technology facilitated abuse and sexual exploitation of women and girls, the, Nas the National Women Council and its members have been engaged in various awareness raising campaigns. One of such campaigns is the digital campaign, It Stops Now, which, aimed, which was aimed at building a culture of zero tolerance of sexual harassment and violence in third level education. Another one of this is the, the Festival of Feminist Ideas and Discussion, especially for, which is aimed at especially for young women, enabling them to be able to come together to discuss things as, as it affects them. There are a few of others like this that have been organized with the, by the National Women Council and its members. Why there is no question about the risk and challenges that this technology facilitated abuses can cause for women and girls, you know, for example, these ones that I've given. Um, it is also important that, you know, we can also use the same technology that is being used by perpetrators to do a lot of good through the campaigns and awareness raising programs that especially us with, um, in the civil society put together to be able to challenge this um, cultural norms that is being perpetrated on, on, on the online spaces. Thank you very much. Jennifer for that sort of outline of how Irish civil society is responding uh, to the challenges but as you say also grasping the opportunities particularly those opportunities to reach young people and to do some of that prevention work and do some of that social norm uh, change that is so crucial really to the prevention to the prevention work um, I'm really pleased I, I, I know that she 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 joins a little bit late but I'm so pleased to um, ask uh, Rebecca Khalil from, from Rainbow Initiative if she's ready to share with us her, her thoughts and comments and feedback. Yeah, uh, so that's great. So, so uh, Rebecca is f from the Rainbow Initiative um, in Sierra Leone, who are a member of the Irish Consortium on Gender-Based Violence Working Group in Sierra Leone. Rebecca is the coordinator of the Rainbow Initiative's Gender-Based Violence Responses, and she is a long-term, highly experienced professional uh, and practitioner. Uh, Rainbow Initiative was established in 2003 and is an independent national NGO providing free medical treatment, psychosocial services, and age-appropriate treatments to the survivors of sexual gender-based violence in Sierra Leone. The agency has 74 staff, um, 28 interns, and has helped more than 45,000 women and girls who have experienced some form of sexual gender and domestic-based uh, violence. It combines its responses with community outreach and national advocacy to try and drive long-term systemic change in Sierra Leone. And we're very glad you were able to join us here today, uh, Rebecca. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, Jeff, given the background of um, what Ringo does, so I will straight uh, go to the um, experience of survivors. So um, through technology, uh, survivors express to um, our services we are providing that um, because of the use of techno technology has uh, made them to become silent. They don't, they don't speak out because of what they are going through. Um, Stories, they tell us that she prom I mean, he promised to buy me a uh, uh, mobile phone, promised to uh, call me, you know, I was called upon. So, so the use of uh, mobile phones or technology, they, they, they use to attract survivors. And um, they harass survivors through um, the use of technology in schools, um, in communities, and... So survivors find it very difficult to speak up because of um, fear of being stigmatized. And um, the use of um, social media, immediately um, issue incidents happens, you hear everywhere. So survivors uh, find it very difficult to come out. And um, they always um, keep to themselves. 
And uh, we find out that uh, older women find it very difficult to speak out because of uh, fear of being stigmatized. And um, together we can um, tackle this one as uh, we've heard from many speakers that um, the use of social media has created more harm than good to survivors. But together we can handle that one, we can tackle it. However, um, the use of the eagerness to use the technology for young ladies is an advantage we can use, we can use to actually um, handle the situation. Thank you very much. I, I mean, I think the stigmatization that you just raised there is, is really important when we, when we try to think about how um, organizations, networks, uh, governments, and, and so on can try and challenge and try to create accountability. So I think it's really important you know, I suppose one of the really powerful things about the hashtag Me Too movement was this trying to change that piece and say that that stigma and that shame doesn't belong to survivors, it belongs to perpetrators. And that, you know, and that, as you said, technology, if we can just use it right, can, can really change that story for, for survivors and challenge that stigma. So thank you for bringing that, that whole piece about the survivor's experience in there. Um, I'd like to ask now the uh, Honourable Nima Lugangari, who's a Member of Parliament for Tanzania and who's um, also here, sorry now to be putting this weight on you, but also here as a, as a Member of the Interparliamentary Union as well, to share with us uh, her thoughts and, uh, and, and uh, reflections on this issue of technology facilitated gender-based violence and to thank her for joining us here today. Uh, she's a Member of Parliament for Tanzania. She's, as a parliamentarian, her own priorities uh, have included the whole concept of gender equality and extending into the digital space and trying to accelerate the digital inclusion in peripheral regions in Tanzania. Um, she's a founding chair of the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance um, and has also established uh, two uh, NGOs in Tanzania, one of which the Amuka Hub aims to accelerate digital inclusion in peripheral regions of Tanzania and I know has actually delivered workshops on this very issue of online violence and harassment as well. So we're very glad to, to, for you to join us today and thank you for doing so. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, good morning. So as introduced, I'm Nima Lugangira, Member of Parliament from Tanzania. Very excited and humbled to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And I first would like to recognize the efforts of our government, the government of Tanzania, towards um, ensuring that we strengthen the online safety, particularly because Tanzania um, is very proud to be the only African country that has both president and head of state who is a woman, Her Excellency President Samia Sulu Hassan. <laughs> and with that recognition, it's, it's obvious that when we're talking about online space being safe, it needs to be safe also for our leaders. And the fact that we have a female president makes it even more prominent for us as Tanzania to ensure that we strengthen the online safety um, not only for our president, but also other women leaders and aspiring girls who want to be um, politicians and leaders due to the fact that um, Her Excellency President Samia Sulu Hassan is now not only an icon or an aspiration to Tanzania, but to the entire continent in Africa and the world at large. Um, secondly, I, I recognize and um, highly commend the efforts of the Irish government in this space of um, the online of recognizing online gender-based violence and the Irish consortium as well, because very often when we're talking about gender-based violence, it's usually the physical ones that tend to be more focused on. And the, the, the online one seems to be somewhat a silent one. So I'm personally very, very grateful that at least I'm seeing countries like Ireland um, bringing this topic, kind of giving it life so it will, have more, it will have more meaning and recognition in different initiatives. Um, even in Africa right now, through the African Union, it has been recognized that digital violence is a big issue on women. But one of the biggest ask, and usually we say the ask at the end, but I would like to begin with an ask, 
is through this CSW, you know, the UN women should recognize online gender-based violence as a form of violence. Because at the moment we speak about it, but it has not been enshrined in the UN women gender-based violence types. And I think it is time that online gender-based violence should be recognized and stated by the UN women to, to that effect. Now, speaking as a woman in politics, as a female parliamentarian, I can tell you that the online environment for us is horrific. And I have been active online prior to being a member of parliament. And the minute I was a member of parliament, it shifted totally. It is two different worlds. And it is not easy being a female politician and also being online. And the dangers that that creates is that it makes our representation online to be bare minimal. I can just give a quick example. In Tanzania, we have about 146 female parliamentarians, but less than 5% are active online. That can just paint the picture of how bad the situation is. Majority of my colleagues don't want to be online because why should we subject ourselves to undue um, you know, treatment? And now, if, you, if I meet you here in the physical world and you abuse me, be it verbally, I have every right to go to the police. But online, I'm not able to do that. And just because I'm a member of parliament that does not mean that you have the entitlement to abuse me. Oftentimes, people kind of sway their agenda and tell us that you women in politics or you politicians don't want to be criticized. But let me tell you one thing. If I raise an issue and you have an issue on the topic that I've raised, discuss the issue. Criticize me on the issue. But when you now evade the issue and start discussing how I look in my outfit and start discussing how I became a member of parliament. <laughs> Thank you. Then you know that no longer, that, that is no longer criticism. When you start discussing that you saw me remove my knickers to someone that paved way for me to become a parliamentarian, that is not criticism. That is abuse, and unfortunately, this is what always happens to us. And unfortunately, when you're a female politician, the easiest route is to sexualize you. That is the easiest route that is used on and on and on. But unfortunately, it's as if society has also accepted that when you're in politics, when you're in public life, they tell us that you should have thick skin. This is what they always tell us, that you should have thick skin. But really, should I have thick skin? And to make it a bit unfortunate is when there is a, a, a female, a different female being attacked online, people always turn around and point fingers at us and say, where are the women politicians? Why are you not defending X? YZ is being attacked. But when the attack is on us, let me assure you, nobody speaks for us. And this is very unfortunate. Nobody speaks for women in politics. Why? Because apparently, it comes with our job title. Apparently. So to be honest, I, I am truly, truly, truly pleased that the Irish um, government and the Irish consortium has even recognized women in politics. And that goes in line with the great work that the IPU is doing. Because oftentimes, when these things are being discussed, women in politics are never considered. Now, the impact of that is this. I earlier stated about less than 5% of my colleagues are online. And this is across, you know, it's similar in other African countries. So what does that mean? It means that we're self-censoring ourselves. And by us self-censoring, what does that mean? It means the discussions you're having here today 
At the end of the day, whom do you need to work with to create these changes? You need legislators. So your biggest allies are your female legislators. But if we ourselves are not online, then you know, you're gonna discuss, you're gonna have great things on paper, but at the end of the day, you need legislation. And you need people to push the legislation. The women in parliament are your biggest allies. But if you're not recognizing the issues that they're going through themselves, how are we gonna achieve what we're discussing? So as a result of the online abuse, many of us are not online. So because we're not online, all of these discussions then become somewhat irrelevant because we need to be online. The second impact is by self-censoring, it means our visibility as women leaders becomes non-existent. And as politicians, we need visibility. If I'm to be re-elected, I need visibility, right? So if, if I'm not able to get the visibility, then what happens to the re my, my chances of being re-elected? So we are hindering women leaders to showcase the amount of the work that they're doing, to showcase the potential that they're bringing on board, to showcase the contribution towards development that we're doing because we're not able to be freely online. The third impact is we have so many young girls and women aspiring to get into politics. One of the fundamental you know, ambitions of the UN women is to seeing that we reach gender equality in women in politics. How are we gonna increase that number? If an aspiring girl who wants to get into politics sees me, a member of parliament, who is supposedly powerful in, in our own right, being abused and downright you know, belittled, yet I'm unable to do anything or take any action. Will that girl want to get into politics? Will that young woman want to get into politics? Who wants to get into politics and suddenly your life is stripped naked? Who would want to do that? So then the efforts of getting to that 50-50 is somewhat being diminished. Um, so to conclude, I think that things that we need to work on are the following. Number one, we need to recognize online gender-based violence, and this is to the level of UN women actually declaring it as an issue. And I think this is where the Irish governments and your stakeholders can come into play. Number two is we need the social media platforms to have a social responsibility on addressing this issue. Um, number three, very quickly, is we need to figure out ways of having laws that can protect women in politics online. And I commend Irish government has the law, um, even the German, uh, German government has an act to improve enforcement on social networks, et cetera. And lastly, always engage us also as women in politics to be part of this discussion so that when we are creating legislation, we can also equally add value to this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Nima. That was very powerful, and I think a real testimony to what uh, the real dangers to democracy and to the real dangers to our really fragile gains in gender equality that women and girls have made over the last couple of decades. As most of you know, COVID really has really undermined many of those gains, and I think what you've just outlined there in terms of the impact on women and girls' leadership is really huge, and we really need to make a particular focus on trying to ensure that women in public life and women leaders aren't pushed out because it's often a very concerted effort to do so. Uh, and so on that note, I'll, I'll ask um, Secretary, State Secretary Sarah Schlitz, herself a woman in public life, and I'm sure has had some similar experiences, um, to share her reflections with us. Um, Ms Schlitz is the 
State Secretary for Equal Opportunities, Gender Equality and Diversity um, in the first gender equal Belgian federal uh, government. And she's also the, proud to be the first S State Secretary with this particular role. Um, she, is also, she has also worked uh, with, with environmental NGOs. She served as a city councillor and she's been involved in grassroots activism in the intersection between ecology, social justice and feminism. So mm -hmm. thank you for joining us today. And uh, thanks uh, to Rodrigue for the invitation. And thanks for putting this uh, important team at the agenda today. Um, firstly, uh, I, want, I wanted to, to thank uh, Mrs. Lungengari Lu and uh, to join uh, his words. Um, as, a, as a political woman, yes, I'm in charge of first uh, fight against uh, gender-based violence, but I'm also um, the victim of gender-based violence online. Um, I, ha I have the chance to have a team who can help me to filter my messages and uh, my, my social networks, but, but it's not the case for every political woman. And me, I don't want to be strong. I don't want to be protected. I, I want to be free uh, to say what I want and to express my uh, politics. <laughs> and what I want is to build uh, a society and an online society where all the girls can say what they want on internet without being afraid by it. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, yes, uh, I, I can imagine you have ever noticed that every time innovations appear, uh, they bring with them new violences uh, for women. Um, and us, as governments, I noticed also that we are constantly behind those developments. So what can we do then? Uh, firstly, I think that we need to understand the phenomenon. This is why I have ordered a pioneering study on attitudes towards sending unsolicited sexual material and the non-consensual possession of sexual material. Uh, with this study, we learned uh, that one third of Belgian women and girls aged 15 to 25 already have been cyber flashed. And over 75% of the Belgian population thinks that the non-consensual possession of intimate images should be penalized. And if you want to know more, I have here uh, books marks with a QR code where, where you can uh, all directly find the study in English, but I have also the version in French and Dutch, so do not hesitate to contact me and come uh, and talk with me at the end of this uh, panel. Then um, I think we need to update our legislations. Um, in, uh, my, my, my big priority is the fight against gender-based violence. At the start of my mandate, I adopted a, a national strategy against gender-based violence, which includes, for the first time, online uh, violence. Um, secondly, uh, in, my, in the new uh, penal code, we decided to cr criminalize online violence, including the non-consensual distribution of intimate images, voyeurism, or deepfakes. Uh, third, we, we know that perpetrators of gender-based violence can also use the digital sphere to extend their means of control and harassment uh, on their victim. Uh, this is why online violence was integrated into my new law against femicide. Um, next, uh, I think that in order to protect survivors, uh, we need to train uh, better our police and, and judicial staff and other professionals, such as teachers or work uh, conciliators, uh, to prepare them to uh, help victims of gender-based violence and online violences. Uh, finally, I developed templates that citizens, women, uh, can freely access and use to inform perpetrators of possible legal consequences. This allows victims to take action even when they don't want to press official charges. You can find all this material on my website if you are interested in um, next, those efforts should be coupled with prevention measures, stressing the need to change gender stereotypes and change social norms which justify, normalize, accept or perpetrate violence against women and girls and stigmatize survivors. This is where I work every day with the civil society, activists and media. Here, men and boys are important allies in promoting positive masculinities and by proactively standing up against gender-based violence. Internet is uh, also a good place uh, for women. Um, this is where feminist activism 
tribes, especially excluded and vulnerable communities, gained new tools to organize, responding to lack of women representation in traditional media. We have seen the extra extraordinary online mobilization in Me Too movement, uh, but also against authoritarian governments worldwide. Technology can facilitate and enforce the capacity of women and girls to act and network if we introduce purpose safeguards there. So for me, it's, it's the point. We have to make, it, to make it safer to help girls and women to organize, to network, to get money. We cannot only say to them, protect you, don't go on the internet. It's not possible today. We cannot build a world, an, an online world, with only men and um, dominating men, because all other minorities are also concerned by online harassment and violences. To conclude, uh, safe online spaces are necessary for empowerment of women and girls and gender non-conforming people. We do not need to be told to throw up, to stand against the, violent, the offline and online violence. What we need is sorority and men allies and political will to build an inclusive environment online. I hope for the ambitious agreed conclusion on this year's team and the continued work that you and women and you all do in creating a world free of gender-based violence. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, State Secretary Schlitz. I think you, you brought out an element there that we hadn't touched on so far, which is the need for our allies, for the men at legislative level, at community level, in technology companies where they dominate, uh, who want to be good allies have to take this issue seriously. They are the ones who have to stop abusing and harassing and perpetrating acts of violence online and offline against women and girls. And we really need our friends and our allies to stand up and to speak to each other and to say it publicly that that's, that's what's needed. So thank you for bringing that into the conversation as well. Um, we did theoretically think we were going to have a panel discussion and do questions and answers from the floor, but we have, of course, run out of time, as is always the case in an event like this. <laughs> so we thought that what we would do is that we would just spend a few minutes, just maybe if there are a couple of questions from the floor that people would like to ask, just while they have such esteemed uh, and expert people here on the panel to maybe hear from them. Uh, so uh, we'll do that just for maybe five minutes, two or three questions uh, from the floor before we have to wrap up, um, because you have, in fact, gone over time already. Sorry, yes. Sorry, did you want to speak? Yes, yes, please. Hello, everyone. Um, hi, I'm Luisa from Brazil, and my question is for you, Member of Parliament, Nima um, Lugarelli. Um, I would love to know which advice you would have for young women who are interested in politics and who are aware of the violence all women who are members of parliament and Congress face. I would love to hear your thoughts on like, which advice would you give for young women who are thinking about the path? So no small question there. Uh, Nima, what advice do you have for young women who want to go into political life, uh, but do have those concerns about the impact online? Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, being mindful of time, I think what I can quickly say is, one, you should pick areas that you're passionate about. You know, have few areas that you're passionate about and you, and you educate yourself and be very well informed on them and then create a niche of yourself in those areas. But then two, um, no matter what abuse they, pro they give, just keep being online. That, that is what has worked um, in my experience. Uh, the abuse was horrific in the beginning, but the abuse and you keep, you keep being online and you respond to the abusers with facts. You know, with facts. Like I can just give a quick example. There's a day I attended a meeting um, overseas and someone just said, you women in politics, just, just go overseas. You do, you, you do nothing, you just go to find men. So I kept, I saved that. And then when I got an achievement from that meeting, I went back and responded with what I had achieved in the meeting. Thank you. Question two is to Nima, Caroline Noakes from the UK. 
delegation, how can we encourage male allies to also have the confidence to speak out and support women? In the UK, we see too many good women leave politics early, and part of that is due to the lack of support that we get from men. Um, um, uh, quickly, I think, first of all, we need to find ways to pick the men who are, who are pro-gender within our groups and also ensure that they get capacitated to understand the dangers of that. But on the other hand, we also need to get the women human rights activists to support women in politics. This is, this is also a key missing fact. I can uh, give a part of answer. Uh, in Belgium, some of politician men are also uh, bullying uh, other political women, so that's a part of problem. So I think uh, political parties have a big responsibility if the, on the question of fighting against uh, sexist and gender-based violences. Uh, for the other one, who consider them as uh, allies uh, of uh, political women, I think they can uh, not uh, lose to uh, sexism uh, jokes, for example, or um, I think to, to give uh, the floor to other women when they are invited in uh, only men panels or give the, uh, they help, help other women to get new, uh, to get posters and uh, credibility uh, at the, at the, with, with the, their own visibility, maybe some, uh, some ideas. Um, thank you all very much. My name's Essie Lindstedt from HelpAge International, and I wondered if the distinguished panel have some advice for us on how to promote the agency and rights of older women online and how to support them in tackling the GBV that they may face online as well. Thank you. So we often hear about technology facilitated gender based violence in the context of young women as being a very targeted group. But how does the issue of being an older woman and ageism as a particular um, uh, form of, of, uh, of abuse uh, also uh, take place? Would any, does anyone? Oh, great. Thank you, Nima. Um, thank you. I think, first of all, at least I know in Tanzania and most global south countries, um, the elderly first need even the skills of how, the digital skills of how to be online. So maybe their level um, of abuse may be there, but maybe not as much. And if they, are, if they have the right digital skills, then they would be able to also protect, protect themselves. Um, and to sum up the issue of the political um, counterparts, one initiative that I've started in Tanzania is to try and get the Political Parties Act and the Election Act to recognize online abuse, and that will make Political parties also have party policies on the issue as well. Thank you. Uh, I think here on the panel has anything, any final words? I think we're, we're going to wrap up. I'm afraid we've gone very horribly over time. Does anyone else? Okay, well, then I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to finish up. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today. And thank you so much to all of our panel members with just so many insights and so much excellent experience and expertise. Um, and also with some very clear asks, both to member states, to companies, but also to UN women. And as, as uh, it's, uh, Ms. Schlitz was also saying, we, we look forward to the, final, for the, to the final documents coming out where we would hope to see a very strong statement, not just about the benefits to technology and to digital life, but also uh, calls from UN women to member states on what they can do to accelerate safety, prevention and security for women and women leaders and women in public life as well. So thank you so much for joining us here today and I hope that you have an amazing week here with so many astonishing women and so many astonishing organisations and that you uh, have a really exciting week here at CSW 67.